beautiful talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Dear colleagues, as uh, I promised highlights uh, in, uh, yeah, how can I say, physics and uh, mathematics, um, maybe I start with um, a question uh, to Ferenc Krauss. These animations, they were just gorgeous. Um, did you create your own animation company to uh, do your future work in a certain sense? Well, that, that's not quite the case. Actually, a company was created, that's correct, but I'm not part of it. Actually, one of my co-workers who graduated in my group, Matthias Überacker, went back uh, to Vienna after doing a postdoc in my group. Uh, and uh, established company Woogieworks Animation Studio, and they are specializing basically in producing these animations. Uh, I come back to that point also with questions uh, to our uh, other speakers. If you, I mean, have these images of the world in a certain sense, people might think this is reality. You know, I mean, <laughs> what? mean it's, it's really, not? it's really difficult to imagine in a movie what an electron does. Well, that's actually so. So, I mean, what about reality and and animations, simulations, modeling, theory? I think this was something that uh, all of you have addressed in a certain sense. Well, maybe just one sentence. I mean, um, gaining direct time domain access to all these phenomena means to, to make them appear in reality. Uh, physicists have been able to, to get access to all these motions in, in, a, in, a, in an indirect way earlier, from which uh, they could uh, infer um, uh, information like uh, how, how rapid uh, these motions approximately are. But with, 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 with these ultra-short pulses, we really have the resolution with which we can look uh, into these processes in real time. So we, we, we can make them appear uh, in reality. Mm -hmm. So that's what Etosecond Science is about. Maybe Ingrid wants to comment on it because, I mean, you showed us how your theoretical approach using this wavelet theory can really be used to get more information about um, how can I say, process underlying images? Well, the, but I think I can give answers to your, an answer to your question on several different levels. I mean, on the one hand, the visualizations that we think of are ways of communicating. I mean, are ways of, of, of we, we have some intuition and we want to communicate that. And then, of course, based on that intuition, you build ways of detecting things and, and if they work, well, that, that, that then uh, validates your intuition. And if not, well, then back to the drawing board. But at another level, you say reality. I mean, when you think of reality, you think, I mean, you use the, uh, the way your brain has used all your sensory information in order to build some concept. I mean, and there a lot is going on too. In a certain sense, what you, what, what you think you see is also uh, goes, undergoes a very complicated uh, uh, par, uh, path. I mean, there is what was visualized, I mean, light and electrons and, and, and the optical nerve. But then there's also what our brain does with it. I mean, our neurons are constantly firing. I mean, what you're actually seeing is like, controlled hallucinations, if you think of all this firing, and it's just steered a little bit by what our sensing does to it. So, I mean, there, so there are many levels at which you could say reality, question mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe one more question concerning uh, also the title of, of your talk, Computer Stupidity. There was this recent uh, competition of Watson, you know, the IBM supercomputer yes. was 
some people who are very smart in answering all kinds of questions. At yes. the end, Watson made it. Yes. So, I mean, how smart can computers become well, from your viewpoint? I, 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 because this was a very archaic example that you gave us with the password. Yes. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, I was, I would actually, it was very tongue in cheek too. I mean, because uh, we like to complain about computers, but look, all the things we can do with computers. Um, I, I, I don't really like to think about uh, uh, are, are we going to get to the stage where we can't distinguish computers from humans. I mean, because I, I don't think, uh, first of all, I don't think we're close. And uh, second, I don't think we have really uh, delimited the question. I mean, people try to do that with this competition. I mean, this, uh, can, can you distinguish between the questions being asked and, and so on? And once you delimit like that, well, then you can perform something, build something that will do that test. But I mean, there are many other ways in which you won't. I mean, uh, so I love reading science fiction, but I'm not working on it. But, I mean, staying, staying with this issue of, let's say, um, Neuroscience and so forth, yes. uh, simulations, uh, modeling. Let me ask Cedric, who gave a lot of examples how mathematics can be applied to the real life in a certain sense. Will we be able to simulate the human brain? Oh, so a, fir a first preliminary question to your, to your question is what is reality, which is a very difficult mm -hmm. uh, question to answer. Uh, a thing about uh, human brain is probably this will, I think probably this occurs someday, but we are very, very far from it. Uh, maybe some, some people in the audience know this, know this quote by the great uh, geometer Misha Gromov, the four mysteries of, uh, in the universe the f in, uh, in related to mathematics. The first is the mystery of uh, physics and the fact that mathematics is so powerful to explain the, the physics world something that uh, many people, many great physicists have wondered about, from Galileo to Einstein to Wigner. Second mystery is about biology, which is one further step of complexity, mm -hmm. so monsterly complicated. And third is uh, human brain, which is, uh, or brain in general. You say human, but you take whatever animal, uh, a kitty of a few months, we are unable to simulate or to understand what goes on in the brain of a kitty, and we are very, very far from it. Fourth mystery is about uh, about reality in the in the scale of Gromov. <laughs> okay, and what about simulating the human brain? Uh, who knows? First, it's simulating a brain. I think has to uh, first you need some new concepts, then you need some really strong power, computing power. It was, it was very interesting what uh, Ferenc was talking about, about uh, dramatically increasing, but this, I mean, to, because you need some learning procedure. You will never be able to understand one by one all the features of the, of the brain and implement them. You will have to have a machine that learns for itself. In this exhibition I was talking about are under display some robots which are learning robots uh, prepared in some uh, laboratory of uh, intelligence, artificial intelligence. These robots talk to each other, emit some sounds from time to time. They also have to sleep a bit, otherwise they get too much, uh, too much heat and so on. And they, well, it's like, it's, it's it's like, as in a way, there are a lot of fun, uh, actually, they sing and so on. And uh, the idea is that some patterns emerge from observing each mm -hmm. other and so on that you don't have put in the machine a priori. It's learning, self-organization. Okay. Of course, this is, the, this is the, the big challenge, I'd say. Mm -hmm. I, I made a, a talk, uh, I gave a talk for, for high school students recently about the, about the, the bat, or the mathematics of the bat and focusing in particular on the ability to flight and the echolocation. And this is amazing what BAT is able to do with this sonar system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All uh, incorporated in this brain, it does what? Spot the prey, spot the walls, avoid the obstacles, uh, fly on the prey, adapt the, the signal to, to, the, to the problem, to the prey and so on. 
all integrated. We are very, very far. Uh, our best radars are uh, miles away from doing anything approaching this. There are some attempts to do this complicated button something. And it does this in an almost optimal way. When you compute the precision that in a signal processing you would obtain using wavelets and whatever, it's very close to the precision that the bat mm -hmm. is able yes. to do. Actually, Meyer said that the wavelet is kind of imitating a bit what the bat does in sure. echolocating. Okay. Coming back, let's say, to, to modeling and so forth. Um, um, Paul, in your talk, you also mentioned synthetic chemistry in a certain sense. Um, you also gave us some hints how to deal with the stock market and, you know, the <laughs> present uh, crisis, everybody has listened very carefully, I guess. How can chemistry, we had this, uh, this uh, issue before this morning, how can chemistry help us to solve, let's say, the energy problem? Right. right. Uh, so first I want to say, if you're taking your economic advice from a synthetic chemist, you need to find a better financial advisor. That's okay. the <laughs> one enduring message of my time here. Uh, I think Chemistry is absolutely essential for, for these crises, as uh, Robert Schlegel told, me, told us this morning, because you're dealing with molecules. And his talk beautifully illustrated that the simplest mo one of the simplest molecules, water, the one that's around us all of the time, contains an enormous amount of energy. But we as chemists don't know how to take energy from the sun very well, mm -hmm. rip that molecule apart into its components, and get that energy out in a useful way. So I think because we're, everything is molecules, we need to understand how all of these processes happen at that level in order to get the big problem solved, mm -hmm. energy, water, sustainability. Okay. Staying with the, let's say, dynamics of molecules for a moment, coming back to Ferenc Kaus' talk, how short can pulses become? I remember when I was a student, 20 picosecond was already a world record. Now we are, well, at what, 80 attoseconds or something like that. What's the next order of magnitude? And will we be able not only to see electrons move, but maybe also, well, nucleons move? For sure, this is a uh, possibility um, uh, in terms of uh, following electronic motion. I think we are quite happy having uh, pulses in the range of uh, tens uh, of attosecond duration. But if we want to look into processes taking place inside the nucleus, then uh, we have to speed up these uh, pulses and, and get uh, shorter again by, by another order of magnitude and, and produce septosecond pulses. There are actually theoretical works that uh, addressed this issue already and, and there are ideas around how to, how to produce those pulses. But I, I, I should uh, point out that uh, this is uh, definitely not in the focus of our activities. Uh, uh, Etosecond science is so young that we actually didn't have the chance to, 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 to use them for, 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 for addressing really important and exciting questions. Uh, so far we have uh, focused mainly on developing the tools okay. and validating the methods. So now we, it's, it's really time to start uh, uh, applying these techniques for complex systems and, and addressing questions like how bioinformation is, is <coughs> transported in molecules, how um, um, uh, electronic motion uh, results in conformational changes uh, uh, which can have uh, serious com consequences. Thank you very much. I think this was it. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the discussion. And now I hand the word over to Sebastian Torner, I guess. Thank you.